The Graphic Histories Podcast. I got bit by a radioactive bug. I tried experimental drugs. Went up for a stroll on a gamma testing range. I found an enchanted urucane. I made a serum that made me small. I modified the serum so it would make I me call. I got radioactive isotope in my Hey, it's the Graphic Histories Podcast. It's here. You're in it. You're listening to it right now. Big thanks to Ukula Mock for our theme song, Superpowers. And big thanks to you, gentle listener, for tuning in once again to the show. I hope you enjoyed last week's episode, part one of my talk with David Cutler. This week, you get part two. That sweet, sweet closure you've been waiting an entire fortnight to get well. You can wait no longer because it is here. It is here. It is clear. Hopefully you can hear it. I mean, it's clear, and uh, and I think you're going to enjoy it. In this episode, we get into Dave's time in school and then going on to his career in Marvel Comics. Since uh, you know I capped it last week at about an hour, this one's a little longer, so I'm not going to bore you with the details of my life. You know that, and I'm lazy, so when I broke up the first step part, I'm doing the second part right away, so it's done. I don't have to do it again, and if I talk about myself, I might talk about what's going on in the world, and I don't know what's going on in the world two weeks from now. It could be, uh, it could be anarchy. So if the lizard people are running the world now, and I don't talk about it in this podcast, it's because I did it early. <laughs> so, you know, if the lizard people are indeed in charge, I just wanted to know that my podcasting skills can be used to help them to lure victims to their, you know, their aquatic caves for uh, slavery or, or, or eating them or whatever, whatever our new lizard overlords want to do. Uh, <laughs> but for that reason, I think it's best we'll just get into the episode. And you can listen to part two of my talk with David Cutler. Cool. So then, yeah, you went to Halifax, and um, then you went, eventually went to Toronto, right? Yeah, to go to illustration school, specifically to do comics. Yeah, so what's cool? I, to... I was spinning my wheels. Like, I didn't know what to do to improve uh and there, there were certain things that i just wasn't getting on my own like trying to draw things in perspective uh no matter how many like online tutorials i looked up uh it just never looked right uh, at all so i was like oh man i need i need some sort of formalized education if i'm going to actually make a go of this um yeah and so uh, i found a school where ty templeton was teaching at and he was somebody who i uh liked and admired and uh first knew from his interviews on the uh, the ytv show the anti-gravity room oh wow that's a, that's amazing uh, when i met him i got yeah, him to so, sign the uh the human torch spider-man miniseries he did which i think is one of the greatest yeah, spider-man stories of all time. Yeah. yeah i think it's one of the greatest spider-man stories of all time it's, it's so good oh god yeah i love it it's somewhere yeah it's, uh so yeah what was it like having him as an instructor i imagine he must have been super cool um he's a very enthusiastic person uh he's also like a very like um he's excellent for a teacher because uh to hear him tell it like art didn't come naturally to him mm -hmm. like sometimes you'll like try to get instruction from like somebody who's like really great not that ty isn't really great but somebody who like like came in and was like a big deal like right away mm -hmm. uh and they'll, they'll try to like impart some knowledge but like so much of what they do is like automatic Whereas Ty, like, basically, like, taught himself a system to, like, he broke down, like, this is how storytelling works. This is how you construct the human head. Um, this, he even has stuff that I'm just, like, I don't understand the practical use of this. Because he had, like, a construction breakdown of the bone of the shoulder. Like, just with, like, a 3D math thing <laughs> to, like, be able to rotate it anywhere in space. And, and I'm just, like... For the amount that shows through the body, you can just fake it. You don't. You don't need to know to this degree. But I mean, it, it helps him and it helps other people. So he really mm. knows how to like be like, this is what you do if you're not there yet. Like mm. these are the steps. So he was like a, an amazing instructor. Plus, like he like he just has like comics like running through his blood. Basically, mm. like this guy like he knows comic storytelling inside and out. He knows what works, what doesn't work. He knows like when to experiment, when to pull back, 
Mm. Um, so he was great in all those respects. But um, to a degree, I think like he maybe inflated my ego a bit. So like I was like, oh man, I'm gonna like come out of here, and like I really thought that like within two years, I'd even have told my friend Dean. I was like, yeah, if I'm, if I'm not at Marvel like by um, 2012. I'll just find something else to do. <laughs> and he was like, all right, man. I'll do what you say here. Was it just because he was supportive of your work or just that, you know, you, you just. Supportive of my work and like um, in, uh, in the, the comiciest ways, like I was the most comics literate person in class. Like yeah. um, a lot of people went into the, the class without ever having put together their own comic page before. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, the meat and potatoes of, like, comic storytelling, I already knew. So, like, my work just, like, it already had that behind it. So, like, it just, it always would, like, excite time more and be like, oh, you're going to be great. This is going to be blah, 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 blah. And I, 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 I was very practiced at seeming, um, I can't even think of the word now, but seeming very, like, down to earth and not affected by it at all. Like, oh you're being ridiculous. But in my head, I was like, totally like buying a hook, hook line and sinker. Mm-hmm. Um, not that he was selling me a bill of false goods because he truly believed it. Yeah. Uh, and maybe if not for like my, um, my mental issues, like I have issues with anxiety and depression, mm-hmm. maybe I could have pushed myself harder. I say maybe when I know, yes, definitely, I could have pushed myself harder mm-hmm. um, and gotten there faster or whatever. But and it did eventually happen. But <clears throat> it, it made for like, when things didn't work out coming out of school right away, and I was doing these things like fifty dollars in illustration. Like I would spend all day for like fifty bucks. Oh man! So um, you came out of school, and that's what, and and what was your first step to try to get the Marvel gig? If you thought it was it was two years away, like did you come right out of school and be like, go right to Marvel or go right to cons with a portfolio? Or what was your next step after? I was already showing cons and portfolio set cons like in my second year, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, with this with this work that I really thought was like there mm-hmm. like i was like oh yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna get this and he's gonna be like you're on i won't i won't have to do my third year of school and blah blah blah, blah. um didn't work out that way uh when i still look back on it i'm like there's something really like cool about these pages that i lost there's like a, a, a quality that i'm still like taken by and i can't replicate anymore it oh. almost looks like and this isn't a compliment in any way but it, it reminds me of like color forms oh, okay yeah you know, planting the stickers in yeah on top else. of each other, yeah, yeah. Things have like this, like um, graphic quality, mm-hmm. uh, which is it, it would be very distinct and unique for a superhero comic, uh, which is probably why it didn't impress anybody. But um, well, were, were, was it because you felt like you're trying to do something different, or is it just the, the way you are naturally progressed at that point? Do, basically, yeah. like, uh, so you weren't striving to be the new. Yeah. Crumb, Robert Crumb of superhero comics, bringing something really yeah, different. Yeah. You were just, yeah, okay. Um, like I, I like I, I wrote my own story for one, which is always a bad move with um, sample pages. You should go from somebody else's constructed story. Um, mm-hmm. So of course I used Spider Man, and of course I used Mysterio, but Mysterio had like conjured up through you know whatever Mysterio means every goblin that Spider Man has fought at this point. So there's like this big splash panel of like Mysterio, like gesturing like a Shakespearean way and all the goblins behind him. But they're all like at a very universe, uniform size and like spaced very uniformly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it does look a little like, um, like clip art Oh yeah. But uh, uh, I was, yeah. at the time I was like, this is the shit. I'm so, I was so taken with it. <laughs> so uh, what, what in between, I mean, what, what did you do when that didn't take off? Is it just doing il- illustrations? For by uh, illustrate, by, by, yeah, illustration jobs, uh, comics whenever I could. It so what just, comics like, were you doing? Uh, Xenoscope comics, like oh, right. very few. I did like two issues of Wonderland. Um, and how did you get that game? How did I? Oh, I think my friend Adam showed his coloring portfolio to them, and he'd mm-hmm. gotten some coloring work on the Robin Hood series. So he knew the editors, and he showed my portfolio to them directly. And that got me um, Robin Hood versus Red Riding Hood, a, a one shot, like 40 page comic there, which was my first like real mainstream thing. I, I did that Northern Guard book with Ty at Moonstone like two years previous, mm-hmm. but that wasn't a great experience. And it wasn't, a, I don't think anybody ever saw or read that outside of Canada. What, uh, 
Well, can you explain why it wasn't a good experience? Is it just because it was like the people running it were disorganized or was it a. Um, I was, I, I don't know, because I, it, it is me coming to terms with like where I actually was in terms of like my artistic ability. Oh, I see. So in class, I was always good at like meeting whatever was set out before me. Like I would do the assignment. I, I would be able to get my head around it, blah, 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 blah. But getting a full 22 page comic script from a real comics writer like Ty, who mm -hmm. writes for people who really know what they're doing, uh, was eye opening. So, mm -hmm. like, every page was just like a million puzzles that I did not know how to solve. Uh, things came out like way worse than I imagined. There were, there, there were things you just you would never draw on your own. So, like, Ty has like, it, it's like maybe the first or second page, this, this woman coming over the top of the hilltop on um, uh, Skidoo and she stops at the edge of like this, this peak, this cliff, and she looks down and sees this makeshift oil yard cleared out in a bunch of trees with all the machinery and the people going around. Like uh, I never drew anything close to that. Nothing like that angle, nothing with like something in the extreme foreground, which isn't that important. Mm -hmm. And then everything way down here is the focal point of the image, but it's also tiny and to get that, angle i don't think i'd ever drawn an image where the horizon line wasn't within the image like it, it mm. would have been like how does it work it would have been off the image either yeah. way so yeah. um it looks like hot garbage basically uh drawing the face for so many angles uh, everything was just i was in like way over my head and was getting mm. like really really depressed it was only 50 bucks us a page Mm. And the Canadian dollar was like stronger than the American dollar. Right. Here. Yeah. So I was like making like 46 bucks a page on stuff that I was like killing myself for. Uh, the sales were abysmal. They haven't even really told me the actual numbers, but it was, it was bad enough that even at this rinky dink company, I shouldn't call them rinky dink because they, they did do um, the phantom books back then and they're gone now. Um, but even at this very small company, that's fair to say, uh, it, we got canceled as of issue two. The issue three was done except for one page. Mm. None of us saw a dime. And, uh, what was Ty's reaction to you? Like, I know you weren't high in your art, but what was Ty's reaction to it? Uh, he always acted very, like, enthusiastic and mm. very, like, happy and pleased with everything. I knew he was frustrated with the speed, mm. uh, especially by issue two. Like, I did pretty good on issue one. Um, but it, issue two was just, like, uh, once I saw the finished product of one, I was like, issue two can't look like that. Mm -hmm. it can't be that bad again so um every every panel took me just ages and as difficult as script as issue one was issue two was even wilder for me i'm sure if i went back and looked at it now i'd be like oh wow this is really pedestrian in terms of like what he was asking you to do mm -hmm. uh but you just um, didn't have the experience i did not have the experience i didn't have the know-how and uh yeah and i and i had i had this like almost like unwavering belief that I did going into it. So that was the worst part to the, the, the not matching, like where I thought my skill level was, where it actually was mm -hmm. like just the idea that Ty, the teacher who I went to the school for was like, Oh, I have this, this pitch for this Canadian superhero comic. Do you want to be the artist on it? Was like, uh, I was like, arrive. This is it. This is the origin <laughs> story of Joe Matarera too, baby. Here I come. <clears throat> And then I start working on it, and I'm just like, "Holy fuck! I'm not, yeah. I'm not Joe Matarera too. I'm not anybody." Yeah. Uh, was it was hard to take, and uh, yeah. Well, but it, some, of it, some of it was like the development side was really exciting because, mm -hmm. like, before we started working on the thing, like doing the character designs and this and that and the back and forth, working with Ty Templeton, designing a new universe, I was really excited by concepts in the book, like. Uh, we had superpowered animals. So like the, the thing that caused the world to get crazy um, in this not too distant future was also the thing that gave people superpowers, but it wasn't like unique to humans. Mm. So we had like a super horse and it wasn't treated as like a joke. Like the horse was just purple and could manifest this like um, silver surfer type rider on top of it. But it was the horse that had the powers. Mm. And uh, there was a giant beaver uh, who wore like this big, like, like wrestler onesie like you know you were the kind that you wear for like the answer with the, yeah. the two straps and shorts yeah. so he had like that with a canadian flag on his, his name was big beaver and he's just fucking huge <laughs> uh, and he, was, awesome. he was a beaver he yeah. his powers to be like like a man 
Not like a and mutant giant human. Polar bear. Um, so the stuff about it, I was like so excited, and just that it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. And yeah, I was. Uh, it well, was, it was like it, for a long time. I feel like it put a strain on me and Ty's friendship, which had passed thankfully. But um, how's he doing, by the way? Is he okay? I've been like he's, he's, he's very high spirits. Yeah. Uh, he seems to be anyway. I can't imagine like uh, he and his wife are going through cancer treatment. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to the previous episode of this. I talked to Richard Gumley. Uh, I, I'm not sure you're familiar with uh, with him personally. No, or not. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah well, but he doesn't remember me. I don't think. But I met him. Uh, yeah. Him and Ty are friends. And I mentioned that he was sick and he didn't even know. Actually, he's like, I didn't know he was sick. And, and uh, yeah, no, I, I'm I follow him on social media, obviously. So I've seen his updates and stuff. But uh, it sounds like he's had a really because he had heart issues two years ago as well, didn't he? Yeah, well, no, during the cancer treatment, he uh, something happened with his heart uh, yes. too. Oh, yeah, and he did have a heart attack a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Jesus. five or six years ago, and then yeah. his his wife in the in the beginning or the midst of her starting cancer treatment, something like crazy went wrong with her eye. Oh my god! I, I don't even know the whole story on that. She had to wear eye patch and stuff, and I was just like, man, when it rains, it pours. And oh. just like a. Uh, not that there's ever an opportune time for this to happen, but Ty was having like a bit of a career renaissance with the, the Batman animated universe, book, yeah. like just this fantastic book. And he's doing like the best work of his career and like to be doing the best work of your career at 50 some is, uh, is noteworthy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it means like you still got it. You still, yeah. you're, you got the juice Yeah. and just to have this like wrench thrown in the gears, but he's a, he's a, a stronger person than most, uh, so I, I'm sure that he's dealing with it like as well as anybody's ever dealt with this yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Um, as far as the uh, creators go, he's one of my favorites. And especially because uh, in comics, it's like I talked to this with, about with Richard a bit that like with comics, it's really hard on the Canadian side of things to point at a lot of um, like, I wouldn't say heroes, but you know what I mean? Like examples of people that are, that are really like, deeply canadian and out there doing canadian content as well as you know popular stuff for the world and uh like ty's one of them for sure and uh, that's why i've always really enjoyed his work and he's an amazing writer so uh i'm really hoping he pulls through because i uh it'd be devastating to to for him not to so i i can't believe that he won't um yeah. it's not a scenario that i've considered really mm -hmm. uh so well i'm glad i'm glad oh, that I you're hope, hope it's going to be another one of those situations where I'm not prepared for the reality. Yeah. I, I well, would be a fucking wreck if... Uh, if uh, are you still in contact with them a decent amount as far as now? now oh, we're going to stuff, yeah. yeah and, uh, we good. always uh, talk hang out at cons and stuff. So. Oh, that's uh, good. I mean, he's uh, a, a great, great guy. He's not the best person to, to sit next to at a con, I can tell you that. <laughs> Why is because that? Because uh, he's a real storyteller. And oh, yeah. yeah. It's okay just to like hear him go on about his like his experiences in, in comics and all the people that he knows and all the like crazy stories he has with this person and that person and he he's he's got a very well thought out opinion on anything so like if you can like give him a topic he can like go and this big crowd will form and they'll like start to like edge in on your table and pretty soon <laughs> nobody can even come by that's funny because yeah. that, when i met him uh what happened when I met him? I, I read an article he put out or some story, one of his maybe bun tunes or something about how his father was Charles Templeton, which I didn't realize. Yeah. Um, and about how they made this movie about Billy, Billy Graham and they depicted his Martin Landau played his father. And, and you know, like, and they, they really made his father out to be like tricked by the devil or something. And it was like, there's all this stuff that, and Billy, like, any, and his father in the movie, to, like, asked Billy to forgive him before he dies, saying he was wrong and all the stuff that didn't happen. And I, I mentioned it to him and then he, man, we talked for probably 15, 20 minutes, you know, yeah. like I, I got him to draw me a picture of, uh, I don't think you can see it here, but um, no. it's, up, it's up there in the wall of uh, one of those ones. It's uh, of the Riddler. He's always my favorite Batman. Oh, villain. I love Riddler. So, yeah. So he did a, a Riddler there. I'll show it to you. I'll bring it down after. So, um, and, you know, so he told me, we talked for like 25 minutes about that. He told me about that. We, we He told me he read Mein Kampf in college and we talked about that for a while. Like, it was like a lot of, like a long conversation about a lot of things unrelated to comics, but it was great. Like, he's such a personal person. Oh, yeah. But I can I can understand uh, why that would be frustrating if you were beside him at a table. Well, my first my first couple of cons, I was there kind of like as his his artist on his new project. You know what I mean? mm -hmm. So yeah. then he was more like aware of my presence and he would even like, he has a lot of Stan Lee in him too, the carnival barker or yeah, whatever. And he would yeah. get over and like 
like hype me up basically that like you got to get to know this guy because this is the guy this guy is going to be the guy that you're coming here specifically to see in five years oh that's uh, nice. not not something that you know he's not nostradamus or anything but <laughs> yeah. was, well that kind was, of was, was nice to hear. so he, he would get me lots of commissions and stuff but later on we were just like two different working yeah. artists yeah well uh, more contemporaries than, know, than big, like his big uh storytelling and uh, i would love listening to them but at the same time like once that shadow came over me of the of the crowd come to see him uh, i'd be like oh man i don't know how well i'm gonna do this weekend that uh it's funny because after i talked to him i talked to tom fowler um and uh uh he was working on venom at the time agent venom or whatever that comic was um and i remember like it was my first experience of getting to know these comic artists and creators as people that are just sort of like interesting and quirky in their own way because i remember i was looking through he was selling a bunch of original pages which are just sitting there like they're not in like plastic or it's just like a comic page board like a stack this big of a bunch of pages from venom like this comic that's selling a bunch and doing really well and i'm still i'm flipping through it and i go um these are from this issue isn't out yet and he looks at me and he goes <laughs> like <that. laughs> so just that alone i was like that made me happy to see that, that sort of experience and get to know these people in different ways it was fun because <laughs> so, i'm sure you could probably get in a lot of trouble for that um Cool. So where's the next step then? So when did, cause you, when did you get into, cause I mean, I, my experience from knowing just on social media from what you've been doing is the, the cat in America stuff. So what was your relationship with Marvel? Like, how did you get in that door? I guess the first question. Um, I guess partly I got in that door because of like a bit of a cultural shift. Oh, whoops. I just whacked my thing. Oh, you're good. This is only an audio podcast anyway, so you, you go blind. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I'm thinking about figuring out a way to put it on like YouTube or something. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll start because I have all this footage. I should use it. Anyway, go ahead. What we're saying. Yeah, but there's, there's like a cultural shift where like when um, like when I was a kid reading comics, the, the, the closest thing to like indigenous comics was like warpath was in exports basically like that was the oh, content of it Th- thunderbirds uh like one comic intro didn't didn't do it for you uh they killed him off first it was until uh, i saw the cover in wizard magazine for giant size x-men number one mm-hmm. I, I i was like oh well so that's the, the debut of storm and nightcrawler and colossus and wolverine and who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's before we get into that, I guess, because um, I, I didn't even really know when we were growing up that you were like, you know, you were indigenous at all. Um, not that it's something you need to like, you know, telegraph or talk about at all times. It shouldn't matter. But like, what is your connection to that? Was like what? Um, like connection to it is the same as a lot of people um, who are indigenous in Newfoundland, where we were just we were very much separated from uh, the past and the heritage mm-hmm. uh, because of the. Uh, social climate of like 50 to 100 years ago mm-hmm. um, if you if you could hide that you were indigenous you hid that you were indigenous mm. uh, and for that matter if you could hide that you were french you hid that you were french mm. um, so uh, so you didn't grow up in the culture i guess is what it... no it was like almost whispered about um, really wow yeah, like it, it would it would come up like uh, the story that I always tell that mom tells me that um, I misunderstood her, but uh, someone had given me like you know those plastic ar- army men, mm-hmm. like the great little green guys. They give me like a bag of plastic cowboys and Indians, and I was like three, and um, very much treating the Indians as the bad guys or whatever, and just like mowing them down with the cowboys. Yeah, and mom was all like what are you doing and uh i was like well i mean the cowboys are killing the indians they're yeah everything in fiction has been this forever (laughs) yeah of course that's what you would think mom was like uh yeah you're an indian and i I just sat there being like i always like um say that it's um well it really was like being like you come from a long line of stormtroopers Wow. <laughs> that was a foot soldier or a putty, basically. Like, yeah. yeah. Uh, just this nameless thing for the bad guy, for the cowboy to kill until 
he got to the real you know bad part or whatever i think i think you um, just came up with a great idea for a graphic novel i love the idea that someone that comes from a long line of henchmen like my father hench <laughs> my father's father hench my father's 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 <laughs> hench and i'm gonna hench god damn it you'll hench like me you know like, <laughs> anyway sorry continue uh, yeah so that was my first like knowledge of it yeah and so then, is, it, is it on your mother's side then i assume it is on mom's side okay. uh, Mom says that her concern was something different because um, on my dad's side, uh, my uncle Jimmy's family, he married a native woman and mm -hmm. uh, dad's very close to them. And she was, she said that she was uh, more concerned about me saying something like that around them. Uh, no, really? but that is not how I took it mm -hmm. uh, at all. In, in my memory, that was when I first realized that I was native. Mm -hmm. Um, from there, I mean, it was never discussed in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. Even for people who like, I mean, I'm white presenting, but even for kids who were uh, very like a, a darker complexion and look very like unmistakably uh, Mi'kmaq, uh, nobody ever called them native. Nobody uh, like in school, anything. nothing. Like in school, there was never nothing. Wow. No, just like, in my mind, it was just like. Uh, uh, and this is like a, a borderline, like in, the innocent racism of children. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> when I would watch like the Cosby Show or Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Yeah. Like uh, Hillary on Fresh Prince of Bel Air and Sandra on the Cosby Show, to me looked white. Mm. Uh, so in my mind, it was just like you know how two brown-haired parents could have a blonde kid, or uh, they could have a, a, a red-headed kid. Yeah. Sometimes you got a black kid, and sometimes black people made white people, and it just like you know it just happened. Or whatever. They were sometimes genes. Come up really dark. <laughs> sometimes they come up really light. That's that's yeah. how, honestly how I conceived of it until I got old enough to understand some of the more political episodes of Fresh Prince. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I did notice though was that the the darker kids were treated very differently than the lighter kids. Wow. Uh, not intentionally, I'm sure, because I I don't remember any like outright maliciousness, but yeah. but certainly it's... there was looking back there was less patience with them and stuff yeah, like that it's very eye-opening to me to, to hear this i mean i know canis had a, a super problematic history with its indigenous people for a long time i mean north america in general has the world has but um like where i grew up and we're not too different in age i think you're what four or five years older than me three or four years older than me i'm 36 uh, no well i'm only two years older okay so um like like I went to school in a very small community just outside of Indian Nation. Like the, the, like I grew up right beside a reserve, the African Reserve, uh, Pactanek, mm -hmm. and um, which is going through a crazy renaissance, uh, renaissance. They're like doing all kinds of work there. But the uh, yeah, like the, there were native people in my school. They were known as native. They would do drum like stuff for presentations about you know certain days or certain things we were celebrating. If it was Christmas, they would talk about Christmas relating to native stuff. Like they were kind of in, in uh, it was sort of there. So the fact that like he's even in Newfoundland, not too far away, like a you know a province over, it was so like not something you discussed or even mentioned. Like it seemed like they were fairly mired in the culture. You know, even with the the, they would do powwows and stuff on the reserves and all that sort of stuff. So the fact that okay. you were, the fact that like you were totally disconnected from it in every way is just it's crazy. Um, well, there were there were there were families and people who did embrace it. Um, none of them lived in my community, mm. but like we would, every summer we would have like the blueberry festival, and there there would always be um, like local powwow dancers, mm -hmm. and uh, it was kind of just been like, oh yeah, they're really into it or whatever. Um, uh, there were people in my family, like my aunt Violet, was the person who made me be, be like, "Oh, okay, it's it's cool, and you can be proud to be native," mm. because it's it, it always even back then it was something she was very very passionate about, oh, and uh, she kind of kept she was like the family person who like kept the old stories and uh, traditions alive. Really, um, she was very connected to her grandmother, uh, who was not about this like hiding it thing whatsoever. Mm. Uh, even, even though I think her husband was. Um, uh, so the, it got passed down through her to, to Violet to basically the whole rest of the family mm. while it was so close to her grandmother. Um, I mean, things definitely started to, to shift by the time I was in high school. Um, and we started to learn about like uh, the, the local like uh, um, heroes when it came to like really pushing these issues like Calvin White and stuff. So mm -hmm. 
and then it was like, oh, okay, I'm I'm connected to this Calvin White guy, and he's a cool guy, and he's gone to like Ottawa and da 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 da. And he's he's really like in, involved in this, and uh, uh, so my perspective really really started to change on it. Um, we still weren't recognized federally or really by anyone because when Newfoundland didn't join Confederation, didn't join Canada until '49, mm. uh, the last province to join. And when we joined, um, our our then premier Joey Smallwood had famously said, "There are no Indians in Newfoundland," mm. as a way to be like, "Don't worry, we're not going to put a big you know strain on your system with a bunch of new savages or anything." No uh, these are all good white folks. Yeah, right? all good white folks are bringing in. Jesus Christ. No, it, wasn't, it wasn't until like 2012 that we, we got federally recognized. Or maybe it was earlier, but I didn't get my status card until 2012. Um, which was a, a big, cool day to... Uh, it's so f- stupid that... Uh, to like put significance on like what the government thinks you are. Yeah, no, um, I agree. Especially considering the the history, it was, it was very it was it was confirming. Yeah, yeah, I get I get what you're saying. Especially recently with all the residential school stuff, like fuck the government and its relation to you know to to yeah. to native peoples and all that, and it'd be like, well, we 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 acknowledge you as native, so here's a card, and I I can totally understand Every what that black sludge coming out of a Canadian's pipe, yeah, and into their sink. I am just my blood goes to a boil. Yeah. But uh, you know, speaking like you know, you grew up around uh, around reservations and stuff, and being aware of like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I swear to you, I never heard the word reservation in, in regards to native people, mm-hmm. uh, in, in regards to human beings, um, until university. Yeah. And I never saw a reservation until I went to Nova Scotia to go to university. And it was like that scene where in Batman Begins when Katie Holmes takes Christian Bale to see like what Gotham is really like, basically, yeah. you know, she shows them like what you, what you haven't noticed from your position of privilege where you got to, you know, sit on your high throne and pretend to be a hundred percent white. Your whole life. No, that's yeah. not what he was doing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a whole, well, there's a lot of subtext to that Batman movie I missed. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm kidding. But yeah, uh, I, I, I mean. just, just driving through a reservation and being like, this is Canada. Mm-hmm. A lot of Canada, and a lot of Canada that doesn't represent it. I mean, it's getting a bit of that now. Um, thankfully, um, I know I haven't watched that show Reservation Dogs yet, but I hear it's really good. Oh uh, yeah, it's awesome. It's yeah, good. and Taika Waititi's producing, which is really cool too. And I, I've heard great things. I know um, I listen to Mark Maron's podcast a lot, and he's really high in it when it came out. Um, so it, it's something I've been meaning to get to. But you know, as far as drawing attention towards that's people live that way. You know, uh, that this is where people live, and and you're right. It is. It, I wow i've always grown up with it so it's just strange to me like as an adult coming into it and saying seeing this for the first time would be very jarring and often i I mean i was very very sheltered to those things uh in a way that i feel like bad about now to to an insane degree but i mean i don't know what can you do Mm. what you're exposed to is what you're exposed to but um anyway in the last five years there has been like Maybe let's say six years. Not that you know it's important to put a, a pin on it. If there's mm-hmm. been an explosion in like interest in like other people's stories, yeah. Um, and as, as, not especially, but like for me, certainly, in a in the for the first time, there's like a mainstream focus on like native lives are worth hearing about. Like mm-hmm. uh, there, there's something here that 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 should be expressed and, and it should be absorbed by everybody and the mainstream so like uh i was almost like out of doing comics when um my friend andy uh uh he started to do he has a company called um, alternate history uh, books and uh, they do a few publications a year and they were starting a new anthology called um does jack Brig- does jack briglio work with him do you know jack i don't know yeah he's a comic guy he worked on um he does uh, some. Might some... Be partner. I, I only know Andy Stanley. So I, I yeah, don't... actually, I feel like Jack talked about that when we discussed it because he does he does alternate history stuff and something like that as well. He's a writer, um, mm-hmm. but he does comics for I think uh, under uh, Chapter House and some of that stuff. So anyway, sorry, continue. Yeah, so he 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 was putting together Moonshot, which would be a, a um, basically the, the first big mainstream um, anthology of native comics by native creators and. Uh, 
he was finding it sort of, uh, I don't know if he's finding it difficult, but I, there, I, I, certainly in the first volume, there are some creators who aren't uh, native. They just um, yeah. needed to fill out the book, basically, because he didn't have the, the inroads to, so, uh, to other um, creators. So, and now it's like, the third volume definitely is a 100% indigenous. I believe the second, two, the second one is too. Um, but that was, the, that was the first thing where I got to actually like, and my first frustration too, because uh, they put me on a story. Um, I was like really excited to like get to like illustrate something that was like um, very Micmac. So I, I kind of thought that I'd be doing something that was of my people. Uh, but, you know, pan-Indianism raises its head. And, uh, I didn't know anything about this. This, uh, this is the first time I even heard of um, their, their group. Mm-hmm. And, oh, that that's okay. With. No worries. It was great. And if I was a better less self-centered person i'd be able to relate to you everything about this comic right now yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway so i i just um i didn't know anything about the people and stuff and i put lots of stuff in the initial treatment that to me was um very personal but mm-hmm. it didn't resonate with the writer and his um his history so a lot of it had to be changed blah, 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 blah. but it was still a, a great opportunity and uh something that i loved working on and then the second volume came, I did that too. And then the third volume came and I got offered two stories, which was um, awesome. Mm. Uh, one of them even was a little superhero-y, um, but like set like 2000 years ago, essentially, but like mm. sort of treating like a, 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 a spirit as a superhero entity in terms of how he was vis- uh, visually depicted. Oh, cool. Um, so that's, and while that was going on, completely un- unrelated, and this is what I attribute this this rise of things like reservation dogs to, whether or not it's true, um, is TikTok because TikTok has like a huge presence of indigenous creators. There's like indigenous TikTok basically, where uh, all all these like great young, super good looking, cool native people are like really. Uh, embracing the culture in the old ways and like showing it to people in this like really really beautiful display of like this this is who we are this is what we have to offer essentially mm-hmm. um some of them got huge 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 uh like do you know notorious Cree? he's probably the biggest one um no this actually is, i don't know anything about this which is surprising to me well, like I, did, I didn't know that well, there's like a resurgence of like native content on tiktok that that brought this oh, around. Man. This is amazing. I have to look the at this. Tree, this is like cool. awesome, and his his like powwow and dance videos are are so freaking cool. Uh, but that's that's where I see like that's where like the little fire got started, basically, like sort of getting like younger people to know more about this stuff and excited mm-hmm. about this stuff. Uh, and then I started seeing it like in movies and in TV and even even like uh, something that's not great, like New Mutants. The main character is a native girl. You know what I mean? Yes, like, yeah, movie, the movie. Sucks, but the uh, I made it. I made a joke about that movie to a friend because I like. I wouldn't say it was the worst thing I've ever seen. It wasn't great, but it wasn't terrible. It was I, I would say you know if you had to give it a, a level, it would be somewhere in the middle or like a four. But like every time, it seems like in in Hollywood, anytime they need a native man to be in anything, it's Adam Beach every single time. Yeah. Every single time. So I'm like, when I saw it, my friends like. uh my friend was like, how was it? I'm like, yeah, cool. You know, the native character is the main girl. And they said some myth and all that. And I said, guess who her dad was? And he's like, Adam Beach. I'm like, yes. <laughs> you know, Slipknot, that guy. Anytime you need a native, like an adult native man, it's Adam Beach in every single thing. So, yeah, he's in Fargo as well. Right. Uh, yeah. And I love that show. Well, the, no, the guy that played um, the bad guy, well, not the bad guy, but Fargo season two, the native guy in that is fantastic. He's in, um, he was in Hawkeye on Disney. He played Echo's father. Yes. Yeah. yeah, he's been showing up and stuff a lot lately too. He was in uh, Doctor Sleep, the uh, the Stephen King sequel to The Shining, the, the movie as well, which is really really good. Um, I yeah, like him. Actually, a lot. I only saw uh, New Mutants once, so he is who I'm picturing as her father. No, it's a different guy. Adam, the guy that played uh, Slipknot in this terrible Suicide Squad movie, the David Ayer one. Oh. That's Adam Beach. Yeah, that's Adam Beach. I thought you were saying Slipknot the band, and I was no, like, no, 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 no. The guy that played Slipknot in. Uh, yeah, this the character that I remember when the ads came out for that movie for and like I hated it. The, I love James Gunn's Suicide Squad. I think it's one of the best superhero movies ever made. Oh yeah, I've, I've um, 
but I hated David Ayer's one. And you watch the trailer and you see like, they're like, this is the Suicide Squad. And you see Slipknot and like a little, just when they introduce them all. And then they show a bunch of clips from the movie. Not one has them in it. And I'm like, well, there's the guy they're going to kill immediately to show you that you can't run away or that your head, you know, your head bomb is going to kill you. So, but yeah. Uh, yeah, no, exactly. So the New Mutants said a character. Well, I mean, Marvel's always... Like native characters depict, I, I guess growing up with comics and loving them as much as you did, I, I'm sure you probably were familiar with Alpha Flight and Shaman, and like some of the other. But like within the Marvel universe, there's only a what like five or six native characters. Uh, and there's only, um, yeah, I mean, most of the mutants. You got Echo and um, Cindy Moon is too, right? The Silk, isn't she native? Or no, I'm getting that confused. No, yeah, maybe so. I'm, I think I'm getting her mixed up with a different character, but. Um, yeah. Yeah, I thought she was. Maybe I'm getting confused. Anyway, yeah, no, I think I'm getting confused. So, but yeah, like it's not like it was depicted a lot in that. So it's cool that that's coming around. But anyway, sorry, continue on. So, um, I mean, in that vein, like Marvel, when it comes to like, if you're like going to do like, you know, the percentages representation, yeah, uh, Marvel is actually like pretty decent at, pre- at representing native people, um, in, in numbers wise, at least in yeah. terms of party groups, like. You certainly you stack up the native characters against like Asian male characters created before 2010. Yeah. Uh, the native side is going to be much larger. It, yeah. Other than Sunfire, you're hard pressed to be like, oh, who, who is Asian in the Marvel Universe? Mm. Who is walking around in somebody else's body like Psylocke or something like this? Yeah, right. right. <laughs> um, okay, so so Marvel started paying attention after you, you think uh, that... that, um, that... Well, I, I, don't, I don't know, like... If, if, to me, this is like one of those things where it's just like cultural influence. Because I know okay. that um, my editors, who I first worked with at Marvel, weren't aware of um, indigenous TikTok. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I do think that it's helped, like you know, run the engines of the world to to spin in this direction a bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, yeah, that's what I kind of attribute to it. And uh, Marvel does, I think, have some pretty decent, thanks to largely Chris Claremont in the eighties, mm-hmm. some pretty decent. Uh, native characters who has uh, I was it's so weird to say coming to terms but coming to terms with my identity growing up uh, they were basically like Forge and uh, Danny Moonstar especially were the ones who I looked to to be like representations of- oh, I forgot about Forge totally okay. forgot about Forge totally forgot about him okay cool I don't yeah. know I'm freaking about Forge uh, yeah, there's, I mean there's Forge there's Warpath there's Thunderbird there's Danny Moonstar there's Echo uh, Shaman, Talisman, um, Grey Crow, formerly uh, Scalp Hunter. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. That's, that's a, that was a good now, now he's like so cool. Like Grey Crow, I don't know if you read Hellions. No. It's, it's done now at issue 18, but uh, Grey Crow and Hellions, he is the best. I n- never would imagine that one of my favorite <laughs> characters would be Scalp Hunter. I freaking hated that guy. Yeah. Uh, wow! But no, no, he, he is awesome, and like uh, he's always a. Uh, it's, you plug your ears for the next two seconds if you uh, plan on reading Hellions. But like, um, one of the main conceits of the X Men now is they're essentially immortal. Like they have the resurrection protocols to just keep bringing them back when they die. And there's like this comedy beat in Hellions where he keeps killing Empath. Like he keeps promising, like if you do this, I'm going to kill you. And Empath will do it, and he'll kill him. <laughs> <laughs> he like comes back almost like you know Daffy Duck storming in up from off screen like all mussed up and stuff. Uh, but yeah, like I do, I do credit Marvel with like for whatever reason, um, even though he gets into a lot of like embarrassing tropes sometimes. Uh, mm. When when you go back and read the books for the time and that they're written by a white guy and a white British guy like Chris Claremont, no less, um, it's pretty impressive stuff, I think. Uh, Maybe that's like my X Men fandom bleeding into it. No, to maybe my parent, my my judgment. But uh, but I couldn't. But you're right about that because I couldn't. I don't think I can name one Native American Disney character or not Disney. Sorry, a DC character. Um, that's a superhero. I'm I, not sure if she's actually Native, but she's coded Native. Um, Dawn Star from uh, Legion of Superheroes. Legion of Superheroes, Disney. okay. But it's like. Big yeah, like I feel I'm like I'm racking my. I, there was like that was it like a Grant Morrison kind of shoehorned one into fifty two that got killed almost immediately. It was he had like a big buffalo head with horns on it? I can't remember what his name was. Oh yeah, he was cool. Super actually. cheap, super cheap. No, what's super cheap? Super cheap. No, that yeah, was, I mean, super cheap. 
Yeah, but then they killed him off fairly quickly, and I was like, oh no, the like one that I actually love. Uh, oh, the Batman. Batman. Yeah, the Batman. Sorry, I just remember that Grant Morrison's uh, Batman Incorporated. I, I, I had the... think he's uh, again, like the costume is a little. I mean, the, the headdress is kind of cliche. Um, yeah. The way it's just like those standard like uh, Peter Pan yeah. like feathers, but just the I just love the man of bats. So I think he's the best. I I can't help it. I agree, so but those are those are two pretty obscure references that are definitely not depicted yeah. in mainstream anywhere. So yeah, you don't see them too often. Yeah, pretty esoteric. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, and also Jim Zub created. I want to say her name is Chinook. Yes, yes, he did. Yes, he did. Uh, we talked. I had him on the show. We talked about that. Um, he did it for Champions, right? Or was she in Champions? No, She's no, like no a- that's in Marvel. Um, he, maybe it's not Jim Sub. Jim Zub. Uh, did- around the time of the New Fifty Two, I could have swore it was Jim Zub, but Chinook. She has like a blue costume. Um, I only know her because I was asked to draw her at a convention once. I'm thinking about. Yeah, I talked to him, and I and I we remember he brought up a- Snowguard. Snowguard is the Snowguard. That's uh, that's who I'm thinking of. Yes, the Champions okay, League. Yeah. Yeah, Champions character. Yeah, which is um, Marvel. Really but maybe she looked at Jim Sub. Maybe Jim Sub was even working in comics and then that happened. But I don't know. Yeah, he's maybe a cool guy. Credit. But DC <laughs> doesn't have very many for sure. Um, yeah. uh, but Marvel does, and so it, it wasn't that big of a, a leap when Marvel decided that they were going to do a um, indigenous anthology. And I I know that Moonshot had some influence because that's where they saw my work which is mm-hmm. the third volume of Moonshot. Which was funny because the amount of times that I went to them directly and was like, look at this work. And they were like, no. But they saw it in this. And, uh, this isn't getting billions like, of views on TikTok. We don't need to care about this right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not that they were at, at all aware. No one would be aware that I was native just coming up to them. Yeah. Um, uh, so not to fault them in that degree. But uh, yeah, so they were putting together um, a new issue of Marvel's Voices, which is their focus on uh, uh, BIPOC and uh, uh, minority groups and characters and creators and giving them a voice and a platform. And they've done um, the African-American book. I think that's the only one that existed previous. So I think maybe um, Indigenous Voices is the second one. Mm-hmm. Um, there, might, there might have been an Asian-American book before, but either before or just after. Anyway, so I got offered a, uh, a 10-page story. I didn't know who I was going to be. I was, of course, sitting at home, like, fingers crossed that it was Danny Moonstar Forge. Like, just please, 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 please. But it wasn't. It was Silver Fox. It was still cool. Mm-hmm. She's X-Men adjacent. And, yeah. Uh, it was actually a great story. And I think not to knock anybody else's work in it, because um, some of it is, is really great, especially um, uh, Darcy's Little Badger story. Uh, uh, she wrote the Danny Moonstar story mm-hmm. in the first. I say the first because the, the second Indigenous Voices will be out, like, next week. Yeah. As of this re- um, okay. Uh, yeah, she did the Danny Moonstar story. It's quite good. But uh, who wrote the Silver Fox story? You did. Silver Fox story, I think, is written writing wise, it's the best one in the book. Uh, who wrote it? Well, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> <laughs> no I'm problem. Kyle Charles. I'm okay. Kyle Charles. I think I think you might be uh, right. Kyle Charles wrote it. There you go. Perfect. All right. I got it right. Perfect. Very nice. And these names. I'm so bad at names. It's good. And the more work I do, the more I'm just like, who did I work with on what? Because um, it's, it's so, so bad. Other people have like this like immediate recall of like um, what they've done and who they've worked with. Yeah. I'm always impressed with people that can pull that Not off. Not Kyle Charles. Kyle, <laughs> Kyle Charles is the artist from Edmonton. And I should know that, even though... Um, we haven't had any contact at all. I don't know what, what his online presence is like. And he did the cover for the next uh, uh, Marvel's Voices Heritage is called, the next uh, uh, Indigenous volume. It was Stephen Graham Jones. Okay. Uh, who is um, from the, the film world uh, uh-huh. and uh, an amazing creator uh, who's, you know, so great that the, their name I can't commit to memory. Uh, <laughs> That's quite all right. It's not this. Uh... So Second time on a podcast I've blanked on his name. Uh, um, I'm just the absolute worst. That's quite all right. I can tell you any of my new show from like where I bought my comics. <laughs> up, a, you can talk like, about Scalp Hunter for days. But... I've worked with. Uh, I, like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. 
So this work is stuff. If if they didn't if they didn't work when I grew up, and I haven't met them personally, doesn't matter how fantastic they are, I will not remember their name. (laughs) Yeah, I feel the same way. Unless someone like there, there are some amazing things I've seen creatively that like unless it's someone that's really really touched me in a deep deep way, it's hard to remember the name. You know, like sometimes like even you just discover someone, you're like, uh, you know, I like this guy's work, but it's like you have to like it has to really resonate somewhere deep to to me anyway to to grasp it in a way or at least in a way that i talk about it so much that it commits itself to memory i guess you know like if you discuss it so much with other people or something you really enjoy you will and it'll just get ingrained in there but um, partly it's that um with, with marvel anyway like so much of your communication with the writer is done through the intermediary of the editor well, okay. So, like the name i see in my inbox all the time is is sarah brunstad or um uh, Will Moss or somebody like mm. that. I, those are the names that I'm just like constantly flashed in front of my face. Yeah, right. I guess so. I never thought about that because I guess in the, in the Marvel system, yeah, they do have the the intermedi- intermediary between most stuff. One thing I've learned, I've been, I've learned a lot doing this podcast is the how the system works. I guess a little bit between the, in the big companies like that, which is interesting to me. Yeah, sometimes I'm like, I'm not even sure if it's like frowned upon to um, communicate directly with the writer. So like mm-hmm. for this, like the next thing I'm doing is like the Thunderbird one shot. Uh, and the writer, plural, the writers sort of set up this like email chain for us to communicate on. And I haven't been using it because something about it seems like maybe I shouldn't even, well, I'm sure the editor knows because I mean, yeah. the writer isn't, but uh, it, it feels like it's like taking the editor out of the loop mm-hmm. in a way that I'm not, I don't even, I don't know. Like, I just, I'm like, I'm so like, I'm here, I don't <laughs> want to make waves. Please yeah, don't, uh, <laughs> I want to. Yeah, I want to do this right. I don't want to make any mistakes. Yeah, I'm just going to do the proper chain of command. I totally understand that. Yeah, which so, again, it's, a, it's not. A, it feels like you've been approached to be like, "Hey, do you want to unionize?" And you're like, <laughs> "Oh, geez, I don't know. That. <laughs> I don't think the boss would like that very much." Uh, that's funny. Um, cool. Yeah. So you mentioned the Thunderbird book. So you did the Indigenous Voice book. You had a, a story with Black Bolt that came out recently too, right? Yes, Black Bolt came out in November or December. Mm-hmm. And that was part another, of another... Like, that was part of the Darkhold crossover, another one right. shot. Um, it's very, very standalone to the point that I'm sure that people who read the whole thing were like, what does this have to do with the, uh, the crossover? <laughs> but I, I think it's a, a good issue. Um, it, like, it explores the psychology and the relationship of Black Bolt and his, his brother Maximus. Um, and was like such a ridiculous blast to draw, um, which is funny because um, being like a hardcore X fan, I have like some uh, resentment towards the Inhumans as a franchise because you know, like as we all know, the there was there was some attempt made by someone somewhere to replace the X Men with the Inhumans and sort of like attach those tropes to the Inhumans. And the X Men really downplayed. The Inhumans were given like this big boost up. Yeah, I so, believe it was because at that point Marvel didn't have the rights to them in the film world. So alleged, uh, alleged. alleged yeah. I, oh, sorry, I didn't realize this is something that you know alleged. But anyway, I, I don't yeah. think anybody like you know really was like. I, I know that I just heard like um, Jonathan Hickman and some other people just like straight up like say like, uh, um, yeah, that is the case. But yeah. I never heard somebody who was actually in a position to be like in the rooms where these decisions were being made say that was the case. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense to me because they went that route with, like, you know, in the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. show introduced the Inhumans and made them basically mutants, like the people with powers popping yeah. up all over the world and to try to control them. And, and uh, you know, in, the, in the Inhumanity was, like, that miniseries Marvel put out that really seemed to be doing the same thing, same idea that, you know, across the world all these Inhumans show up. Uh, but, yeah. Well, it, I got a tip on my shoulder about the Inhumans. Yeah, I can understand that. If you're an X-Men uh, fan, of course, well, I, I would. Um. Growing up, I loved the Paul Jenkins and Humans with Jay Lee. See, these names I know because I was like yeah. 12. I love that series. I used to get this comic. I think it was like Marvel. Marvel put out some kind of thing that was reprinting a bunch of their Marvel Knights stuff. It was like Marvel Knights magazine or something. It would have like an issue of the Punisher, the Punisher series that Gareth Ennis was doing. It had an issue of the Black Widow series um, that was going on. Would that introduce Natasha Belova? It'd have um, an issue of that that um inhuman story and a few others in it so i kind of came to i eventually got the trade with the whole story and read it all um the full way through but i remember I, that was my first experience with it because it was beautiful the art was beautiful yeah so 
Yeah, the um and Black Bolt uh, is a very interesting character, one I've always thought is super cool. And uh so I'm glad you got a chance to work on that. Just as a, a side note on the, yeah. the topic of remembering things. Uh while I was working on the Captain America book, which was the, the second thing that I did after the uh Silver Fox story, um, my friend Adam Gorham is doing the Blue Flame mm-hmm. uh, uh superhero miniseries with uh, the writer Chris Cantwell. And well, every time he would post about it, he could tag Chris Cantwell and I always be like Man, that's a familiar name. Where do I know that name from? Chris Cantwell. Chris Cantwell. Yeah, he's the writer on Captain America. I mean, the book that I was doing currently. Uh, <laughs> Darcy Little Badger was she was the writer on our, our backup story, but like the the event, the United States of Captain America, was a Chris Cantwell book. Uh, I I talked to the guy personally, and I was like, Where do I know, Where do I know this man? Well, let's let's dig into that just a little bit. Um, I mean, I know I've hit you a long time, but. Uh, the so the Captain America thing that was them them making versions of Captain America that rep- that represented all different aspects of America, right? Like different. Yeah, it's like people. all well, not not all, but different corners of like it was like his like localized in the six one six universe version of like almost like a Spider Verse. Yeah, uh, where he's traveling across the country and he's finding all these people who've been um, influenced by either him or uh, the Falcon when the Falcon was Captain America mm-hmm. into becoming their own version of, of that identity. And you, um, you designed the character too for that version, right? Joe Gomez? Yes. The character? Uh, Joe Gomez was our character, a, yeah. a Kickapoo uh, native man um, in Kansas. Yeah, yeah. sounds right. Uh, yeah, so, sounds right. Uh, so I, I was like super influenced in that because I was like so into the Notorious Cree at the time. Uh, mm-hmm. And I still am, but... Uh, he does a lot more like slice of life videos now, whereas before he was doing like really nicely produced um, uh, uh, powwow dance videos. Mm. So just like um, I'm not a very well, I am. I am a social person. I always say that I'm an I, I'm an extrovert, but I'm a loser. <laughs> uh, so like I have like extreme social anxiety, especially like more and more the older I get. But like I am happiest being social. Mm-hmm. This is not important. What's no. important is. It's when important. I'm actually in a social situation, like if I if I go to a powwow, uh, I feel awful. Like I I have trouble connecting to people, um, I, and that's not not just anywhere. Like if I go to a bar or a party or something, like I'm in, I'm in the corner, even though I don't want to be at all. Mm-hmm. Like I want to be in the center of it. Um, so I I can't really like stop and like take it in in person, um, but. Uh, being able to like watch it on TikTok and, and 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 see like the movement of the ribbons and stuff, I was just so like, oh man, this is so like, it's like, well, it is. There's storytelling in the costume, uh, like it's 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 almost like it's it's pageantry, but it's almost superhero pageantry in mm-hmm. a way. So as soon as they're like, oh yeah, we we want him to really like reflect native culture, I was like, well yeah, he's definitely going to reflect powwow culture as much as I can because. I want to get those ribbons moving, which are really annoying to draw. But. Yeah, I would imagine. I was going to say, on an artistic standpoint, that's got to be diff- difficult to draw. Um, well, luckily, I only draw the costume twice <laughs> professionally, whereas <laughs> the guy who did the main story had to draw it from all over. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, right. here you go. <laughs> Here's a burden. Enjoy. <laughs> yeah. um, but there was like, I remember you and I discussed you about you coming on the show back when that came out, and it was just you were sort of just a bit down about all the uh, like some of the the negative blowback that comes with anything you put on the internet that makes anything different than what people are familiar with. Um, have you oh, come yeah. to terms with that in a way that you're you're better because like I, like I, 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 I was a very like when I read like I mean nerdum is a double edged sword. It, it gives a great. Uh, community for people to to talk and express ideas about the things we love. It's great. But you also get all the the people that are very ingrained and don't like change and just want things to be the same as they always were. Um, you know, that push back really hard and often incredibly disturbing and and uh way like I can't even put it into words about how disgusting it is to me when people get really upset about stuff like this. Um, you know, it the, the one thing I used to always say about, like, for instance, the Ghostbusters movie, the female Ghostbusters movie they made, I didn't really care for it. I thought it was an okay movie, but it wasn't whatever. It, but when people are losing their shit about it, and they're like, they're destroying my childhood, blah, blah, blah. I was like, it's not like Melissa McCarthy is kicking in your door and kicking into the balls and taking your Ghostbusters DVDs. Just go watch them. You don't have to go watch the movie if you don't like it. If you don't like the fact that there's an alternative uh, Native American Captain America, because it's not your Captain America. 
don't read it. You know, like you don't have to shit all over it or try to ruin it for the people that are enjoying it or embracing it. Like, have you come to terms somewhat with that in a way that you can can deal with it? In a, a... Well, I mean, the 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 the, the flack from like the comics gate type crowd, uh, never really bothered me. Um, yeah, because you've always I, I been. You've always been fairly vocal on social media with people about that. Like I've, I've, I've seen you when you comment sometimes on other people that are like comics gatey in the way they're talking or trying to like, you know, stop anything. Anytime they try to do anything that's inclusive, they're like, oh, it's, they're making it political and it shouldn't be about that. And you're, you, you have so many, like, I remember one guy said something about that, about the X-Men and like, oh, you're making it political. Or and you're like, what do you think it was? Like, the whole, you know, like the whole idea about a marginalized group that society looks down on because they're different. What the fuck do you think yeah. that was? Like you're reading really. Yeah. Like, so uh, even the ones who are like truly vile. And uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not, I haven't signed into Twitter since. So, I mean, mm-hmm. maybe it did have some effect on me, mm-hmm. but, um, uh, I mean, people were like, I mean, there were direct death threats. There were like, uh, really? Oh my God. They, were scalp, they, they wanted to scalp us. They wanted to scalp the creators. Which I, from my perspective, I thought was funny because I have nothing up here to get a grip on. So, like, good luck. You know? uh, <laughs> good luck scalping like, this. Like, one of those people that's like very uh, careful at unwrapping their Christmas presents, just like going along the seam with the knife and like really trying to like pry it up. He's got like a he's got like a vegetable peeler. He's just slowly trying to get it. Get it like, put my scalp this way. They have a little tab to pull. Uh, so all that stuff, I was like, "Oh, they're pieces of shit. They'll always be pieces of shit. Whatever." But um, when it comes to representation, like when it comes to like doing representation of other people, it's like, um, oh, what's a good way to liken it? Okay, if you're a toy collector, okay, this is Aston. Mm-hmm. But if you're a toy collector and you're also a fan of something, so like you're a fan of Marvel Comics and you really love Speedball and they never make Speedball stuff and then they finally make a Speedball toy and uh, something is wrong. It's it's not the Steve Ditko Speedball. It's the... Um, it's the, the, uh, the, 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 the pain-obsessed one from Thunderbolts? Yeah, or, or, or even just the one, like the, the Zeb Wells one, uh, I think Scotty Young, that kind oh, of yeah, yeah. black the, the orange. Um, it's not your speedball, and you just know this is like basically your chance to get a speedball toy. And it's not your speedball, so there, it's gone, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, it's, it's cool to have, but at the same time, it's like full of disappointment. Yeah. Um, when it comes to representation, there's like everybody has their own version of what they want to see of themselves in something. Uh, so especially like the older comics reading native crowd, uh, of which there are probably more than there are younger comics reading natives. Uh, they want, and I don't want to put words in their mouth, but to me, they want a native superhero who's almost native in name only, like in mm. name and in cultural practices. Yeah. But when you look at the costume, they would rather see um, uh, an indigenous man in Superman costume. And that's it. Like that's, he's wearing the, a, a costume that any white person would be in. Uh, you couldn't look at the costume and identify him as native, but increasingly with younger people, uh, which I am, insanely generously including myself as one <laughs> uh, like they and we want to see the culture reflected and respected and included mm-hmm. so i want to see native superheroes who show aspects of their their culture and identity through like the superhero costume is about storytelling and it's about pageantry and it's about mm-hmm. expressing something yeah and i identity is, is totally fair game to be expressed in a respectful way through the costume mm-hmm. so we had lots of people who were just like uh, i'm not about this because you know it's it, it seems stereotypical to me that you he has he has feathers and he has ribbons and he's in um powwow regalia and so <laughs> the, them i could see like yeah that's fine but there's this other crowd on the younger side who and i knew this is going to be a problem going into it i knew it because Captain America to me represents something very different than Captain America does to someone who doesn't read comics. Mm -hmm. Like I don't look at Captain America and see the flag, even though it's wearing it. I don't see imperialism. I don't see the history. I see like the best version of what we could make with the mess that history handed us. Yeah. Like 
the, the best guy to be wearing this and trying to go forward with it. But for lots of people, um, lots of indigenous people, like the American Canadian flags and identities mean something very different to them than it does to white people. And even, even that it does to black people. So mm -hmm. for them, it was like a, a hard pill to swallow. But this is like a minority of, of the reaction, but this was the reaction that I took to heart the most. Oh, okay. So yeah, I, so what you're talking about is people that actually like were native or people that did embrace this that were upset about it. Not so much just the, yeah, the white assholes that are like, I any other superhero, but the yeah. fact that it's Captain America. So mm -hmm. we get called like colonial apologists. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. I can see why that would be more like you would take that more to heart. Cause it's your, it's, I guess identified as people that are within your community, essentially not really, you know what I mean? But that, that are that native or, or part of that world that, yeah. that you yourself are I, in I, and, I basically accusing you of being a traitor who I think have a point, like a hmm. very solid point. Um, and then who I knew had a point going into it, but I'm just pragmatic. Like I'm from a generation of like, and it, it's so, it's so naive because especially like in the last five years and everything that's happened politically, I'm still of the, like, can't we all just get along? Yeah, like, I'm God. like that too. I'm like, I, it, like all this shit to me, if it could just get to a level of respect, like people go like you can have people you disagree with, especially in this whole COVID world we live in with, you know, vaccines and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, you can disagree with someone. You can think that you can totally, but you can still be kind to them. You know, <laughs> like you can still be nice. You don't have to like so threaten to murder. They're not nice and kind. You drive them more to the other side. Yeah, exactly. Extremist views. Um, and it's funny because somebody on the other side would be like, well, you're kowtowing to extremist views by, you know, not loving the flag or whatever. And like, I mean, it's it's so weird because I have no love for the American flag, but Captain America is my favorite Avenger. I yeah. freaking love the guy. Yeah. I love Chris Evans. I love I, I, Captain America was like the second superhero I read, essentially. Um, I think it's the, the same reason. Storyline. And you and I have discussed this before, I think, back in the day, or maybe, maybe we've discussed this somewhere, but... Um, I think it's Captain America to me is kind of Marvel Superman in a way that like, and I, and I like, I like Superman because I feel like we do need heroes that are, are paragons of good people. You know I mean? You can have the tortured vigilante superhero or the guy that has the hard backstory or the badass that, you know, toes the line, the Punishers and the Wolverines. But it's, but I do think we need the good for the sake of good actually wants to make a difference character. And to me, Captain America is that version of it. And the, the it, he doesn't he's not like yeah bald eagle or a flag he wears it but i don't he doesn't represent the same to me it's more about the character itself than america as an entity you know yeah and that's why whenever i see like anything that tries to make these characters dark and broody it, it bothers me because i feel like you're missing the point of the character it, it's also like um two things it, it, it's also like the same thing as like when i watch hamilton which mm -hmm. is a musical that i really enjoy even though at the same time i'm like these are rapping slave masters. Like yeah. the, the whole time, I'm like this is, this is kind of fucking gross. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the thing about America and Canada, to an extent, is we like our sort of model our political system so much after them. Uh, like by hook or by crook, by accident or by people who actually weren't pieces of shit putting in the right wording, when they set up their rules. Uh, they used language that ended up liberating a lot of people who weren't liberated when, you, you know what I mean? Like mm. when the countries were formed. So like yeah. they said all men are created equal. They meant all white men, mm. but that was so presupposed that they didn't say that. So they yeah. go forward to the document and be like, says all men, I don't know. What <laughs> yes, it's right there. It's yeah. nice and that it's nice and that works out in your favor. You know what I mean? Because yeah. often it's like, well, we can the right to bear arms. It's like, yeah, well, it used to be a musket that you threw a yeah. ball in and went like this and then shot it. And you kill one person and then take you 10 minutes to shoot again. You didn't have a semi-automatic, you know, or a new, you know, <laughs> the yeah, shoot like, your bullets a second. Yeah, absolutely. It, it does work the opposite way. Yes. And, uh, but it's nice when it does work in the in the positive in the positive venue. That's I don't know. I'm just, I, I am, and I, it's funny because compared to most, I'm an iconoclast. Like I don't, I don't worship these historical figures. I don't even like them. Mm -hmm. uh, but at, at, at the same time, I'm just like, we have to work with what we have. Uh, and I just don't see a realistic scenario where like in any of our lifetime, that American flag goes away. Mm -hmm. 
So let's try and be the best version of this. Well, and it's also like people are so narrow minded, like things happen in waves sometimes too. Like you have to think about the fact that, okay, if you're, you're looking for more native representation in comics and they're really trying to striving to do that, this is a step towards it. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean this is it. All you're going to get is native is native Captain America. That's it. We're never doing another native character. This is what you get. That is all we're going to get. It's like if they put this into the world and it does well and people like it or whatever, you know, it generates the people or gets involved, there'll be more. Like just like it and and if you don't support it, don't and wait for the more. If that's what you're if you really want. Um, to that we get the you know, Captain Native or whatever you want to call him. I don't know, but um, you know, something to the effect of what what's a better representation to you, but shitting all over this, uh, this basic stepping stone and in, in getting towards that it's it's not helping anything like it's really not uh, I mean, if I you mean, were nicer about it i think the, the discussion is important because these yeah. are things that i would like to have said to them to them directly but i was like too cowardly to engage really and not really well, savvy enough because i mean these are coming from accounts that are like um native an- anarchist accounts essentially like, yeah i mean okay. they really are like the far even compared to me, the far left. Well, they spectrum. seek out anything native related to have an opinion on and make make a deal. Oh, of yeah. It. So yeah. Not write a yeah. Yeah. Lies, I'm yeah. not going to yeah. play that card. I'm not going to be like, yeah. you know, like, oh, thanks, you're a long box. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see a photo uh, of your comic collection. Yeah. So, but I, and then at the same time, I get philosophical about it because I'm just like, do I have to agree with every native person? Uh, that I create, like, do I have to like align with mm. all their views? Like, yeah. it's when, like when somebody like hears a song and they're just like, "Well, I don't think that person went through that." And it's written from the first person. Like, not everything written in the first person is from the perspective of the author. Okay. Like, yeah. I wouldn't run around the American flag either, but this is a different guy. Um, and it's not like the, when the issue came out, it was like it, it's so clear that he's conflicted, but he's inspired by Captain America. So mm. there, there are changes made, yada yada yada. But anyway, that was the thing. Um, I'm down to ten percent bad. No, thirty-seven percent. That's right, crazy. We're, we're wrapping up. We're wrapping up anyway. You're good. No, we're fine. Okay. You can edit. Like, no. Oh, and I, I don't edit a lot unless I have to. I kind of like the, the the natural conversation. I might make it two episodes because we're going long, but I like it. It's a great conversation, in my opinion. Um. um yeah. Sorry. Can yeah. You know? But I want to make sure that I talk about Thunderbird. Yeah. That's what I'm. Hundred percent. Yes. That's where. That's the the last step. Um. But you've come to terms in a way that you can deal with this, I guess, and not. Uh, it's always a thing, man. It's yeah. always a thing. So, like, I don't want to, like, um, uh, throw anybody under the bus, but, like, uh, every, every, so so the, the, the new design for Thunderbird came out. I knew it wasn't going to go over well, um, probably because he's turquoise and not a lot of superheroes wear turquoise. I like that, though. It's cool. Like, it's different. I think, I think it's cool, too. It wasn't my idea, so I can't take credit for it. That was, like, something that the, the writers pushed for. Um but are you like and this is just a side note before we get back into this are you like like becoming the design guy now for like new let's like you've redesigned to or is it just native specific characters or is it just that they like your your take on coming up with costume design in general so they're like they're coming to you for new new designs or is it just I, native well, specific? I tell you what the thinking is um i can only assume that they did like the native captain america uh cool. right. because they did come to me with this uh so I, I dig both designs a lot so i'm i'm hoping that if they have new characters coming that you might be a voice involved in, in designing their their general looks i think it, i think it's cool i'd like to see more of it yeah I, I was pretty proud of it um but i mean i had people approach me several um uh who were of apache origin who like argued against certain things because they didn't think that it lined up culturally um, but, so we had like a very close conversation back and forth. Can you be more specific uh, on that? Like, what part of the Thunderbolt design were they that, or uh, sorry, Thunderhawk design were they? Because uh, uh, like it's uh, <clears throat> one guy was really against the colors in general. Okay. Um, and another guy was against the inclusion of fringe because okay. he said that Apache for war fringe mm-hmm. historically, anyway. Uh, which is which is fine um so we had like this back and forth very pleasant conversation but then i finally found like the sources that i use which were all like apache written and i asked them about them and i was like so what's the discrepancy here because this person says that historically fringe was like the thing blah blah mm-hmm. blah and yellow was another sticking point i really hope this guy doesn't want to listen to this podcast because i'll feel bad mm-hmm. and maybe he has other reasons for for what he did but like after i i, I asked him just radio silence so to me, kind of like he was weaponizing his knowledge against me, which I, like it just makes me feel like such a shitty 
outsider really to have to like like I, I'm I'm honestly like I'm not trying to hurt you. Like I'm I'm yeah. doing my best. I'm, I'm sitting there researching everything I can because I don't believe in pan Indianism. I yeah. know that the Apache are very different from the Mi'kmaq, and uh, I I want to be right by that. But just that he they dropped off after you you actually showed that you were it, you, you actually showed that you did some research to to follow up their story and backed up you know your claim alone that they they dropped off. They didn't expect yeah, you to do. They thought they could just mouth off to you. Their, their position of authority as an Apache man yes. to be like, these things that I don't like for personal reasons are something you shouldn't have done. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe not. Maybe maybe it was absolutely sincere. And you know, somebody had a heart attack or something, and he hasn't talked to me since. But, but it's uh, all. It's it, also yeah. to me. It's like they're like. <sighs> You design a character for a comic book. You, it's, it shouldn't be your responsibility to answer to every hundred, you know, however many people read comic books or, or read enough of these comic books to have interest in what this is. Like, to know, um, you know, it's not your, your, your to defend your creation to every single person, you know? Like, I, I get, but I think it speaks to your character that you actually are taking the time to do the research and all this stuff and then actually engage in a real conversation with people that have concerns because most people just dismiss well, it. Uh, when it comes to like, I don't with everybody because when it's people just quibbling over like, I don't like turquoise because turquoise, okay. I don't respond. Yeah. But uh, so far I've responded, I think, and this, if somebody might hear this and be like, you didn't respond to me. <laughs> but I, I, I've, I've responded to every um, indigenous person who approached me directly with concerns. Okay. Um, but the concerns are often, <laughs> they pull you in such different directions that it just becomes like, a, I'm doing my best and I can't please everybody. Yeah. Because, like if I did what you said, the last guy who emailed me would be, going off his rocker basically because that's the exact opposite thing that he wants to see and i and i hope that you all get to see what you want to see and plenty of it and mm -hmm. i hope this is just like a drop in the pan of what becomes larger representation for native people for black people for asian people for gay people for trans people and superhero comics and beyond and we don't all have to put all our eggs in one basket and expect it to be the perfect basket that's just us mm -hmm. so i totally understand that that desire because you when you get so little you want it to be what you want uh so i i don't i don't it, it hurts me is the thing that I, it makes me it ruins my day and makes me really sad yeah <laughs> but uh it's it's all i can do it's all i can do no i'm sorry to hear that you that you that it has that effect in you but um like and I totally agree. You can't you can't answer to everybody for everything. And and I think that allegory you just said is perfect. Like you're right. You can't like it. It can't be the perfect basket for everybody. Hopefully, it becomes a huge basket, and and it's you know there's there's something in it for everybody. But you know this is this is just a part. You know, and uh, I don't know. I think it's super cool. It's very different. It's unique. I mean, and also, have you had anybody coming at you about the character in general? People like Thunderbird wouldn't wear that. You know, or like any of those sort of people, because I feel like considering he's in the comic one comic forty years ago, you know, like yeah. I yeah, like I feel like to 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 come at you with anything like that is such a such a crap. I'm shoot. curious how the actual issue will go over with those same people who have like very specific ideas about how they want to be represented. Because mm -hmm. like what I love about Thunderbird's character in the few issues that he's been in, mm -hmm. and what we're keeping is he's not he's not the model minority. Mm -hmm. He's not like, you know, when uh, uh, a, a cop kills uh, a black guy and Fox News is like, this guy has got to be a paragon of virtue before you're allowed to care at all. Yeah. Um, that's not who he is. He's not the nicest guy. He's an angry man. He's a prickly man. He's someone who has trouble relating to people, even people, um, even other mutants and even other people in, of, of his own Apache origin. Like he's... He's on his own, really. And the, the interesting angle is that he's woken up uh, years later. His, his younger brother is older than him and like a foot taller than him. Mm -hmm. And he's found that this group of people called mutants that he barely even knew were something other than him uh, when he died have deified him. And as far as they're concerned, that he, he's like he died for the cause. Like he, he is Malcolm X. He's Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. And he's like. I didn't want that. Yeah, that's not that's not who I am. So who am I going to be, basically? To no. not 
let these people down. That's awesome. Uh, I, that, that's what like it's so fucking excited me because like I love native representation in comics. I love the X Men. I love history minutia, and I love that like the villain is like pulled from like deep cut Warpath Thunderbird history. Okay. Um, so oh. it, I think it's going to be a really exciting project. Uh, I can't wait for people to see it, uh, and I'm hoping. That is the best thing I do. The last thing I did was the best thing I did so far, which comes out next week. Well, I That's think every American creator Eagles strives story. to do that. Man. Yeah, in, in in Marvel Voices Heritage number one, which comes out January fourteenth, something like that. Huh? Uh, whatever the Wednesday is. Um, that would be right, I believe, if I'm looking at the calendar correctly. Uh, the twelfth is Wednesday. Yes, yeah. that is a that is a great story about um, someone that the world has moved on and left behind, basically trying to to catch back up and, and find his worth. And I, I think it's a, a great story that people will, people will really respond to. Um, and I did my absolute best and the coloring is beautiful by Paris Allien. Uh, yeah. So check that out next week and Thunderbird comes out in April or something like that. I yeah. That, is that, that's part of giant size X-Men, the, the new, the it's, new series. It's giant size X-Men Thunderbird number one. So it's continuing that thing from last year with the storm and Jean Grey issue and the Nightcrawler issue. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Um, well, I'm super excited to read it, man. It looks super cool. And uh, I love I love that what you described for the character sounds like a, a really cool and different take on it, which which is cool because you're right. Comics do t- tend to make all these characters, these, uh, you know, paragons of virtue, especially when they represent a minority because they don't want anyone to, uh, you know, they don't want anyone to take anything negative away from it. But in the end, minority or not, we're all people and uh, yeah. we all have our flaws. So you, I think that needs to be represented, too, because that that's what makes the most interesting comic characters the people with flaws. Not, you know, I mean, I do agree there's a place for Superman and Cat America, but if they're all Superman and Cat America, it'd be pretty boring. So that's uh, why I love books like, like the X-Men and Legion of Superheroes, because they're like cheap team books exclusively. Mm-hmm. You can have personalities that like really when you boil them down, like it's like Spider-Man is like Captain America who tells jokes. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, they're all just very, very good, perfect people. Whereas mm-hmm. like guys like Gambit and Wolverine and Thunderbird and North Star and Storm and Emma Frost and Cyclops, um, they have edges and they're not always great and they're not always the good guy. Um, they make mistakes and bad decisions. Mm-hmm. And uh, I really hope that Thunderbird, uh, because or in spite of my redesign, gets to join these upper echelons where I think he belongs. I think he should be on the same tongue that speaks the words Nightcrawler and Colossus at the very least, because he was there with them and, uh, he, he didn't really get his just desserts. Well, he will now. That's awesome. Oh, man. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, dude. And uh, oh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I don't think anyone on earth will listen to the entirety of this. It's no, they definitely. Oh, no. They, oh, I might split up into two episodes. But uh, I spoke to Mike Ruth for like four hours and I split it up into two, too. He's. Uh, oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, Mike's um, Mike's amazing. So uh, uh, and I think you two know each other as well, do you not? Yeah, we do. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, he's a great guy. I met him through the concert circuit out here, but um yeah, no, I, uh, any, anything I missed or anything about you want to talk about coming up or? No. That's it? Um, cool. I think uh, that's it. I still haven't seen um, the new Spider-Man. So I can't oh, my God. Uh, I know. I know. I agree with you that Spider-Man 2 is probably the best Spider-Man movie ever made. And I think we do differ a little bit on how much I enjoy the Marvel version of Spider-Man. Um, I do you really must re- like him more because you couldn't like him less. <laughs> what? the? Oh, what do you I'm mean? The new? Oh, you don't like Holland at all. Uh, I think he's a great actor and I think he's great in civil war. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like after I, that, I don't know who he's playing because it's not Spider-Man. <laughs> well, I'd be interested to see your opinion after you see it, because my, the, my prediction is that going forward, he's going to be more Spider-Man than he has been. That is what I'm saying. You can almost like, I don't want to ruin anything or spoil anything. Um, I absolutely love the movie. If you're a Spider-Man fan uh, and, and it's a love letter to the Spider-Man movies that came before it to the Spider-Man mythos in general. And if you didn't like Marvel's depiction of it, you can almost look at everything that came before this as part of his origin story and this capping it off and putting him on the path that is more the Spider-Man we know from the comics is what I would best to describe it. I I would Uh, say... I I don't think I'll see it until it comes out on digital, but... um... Oh, right. Well, I don't think it'll be too far away, at least to rent it or yeah, whatever. But it'll be a little while yet anyway. But it really forward. feels like, I wouldn't call it course corrections. I don't feel like it's like it was so off the rails we had to fix it. But I feel like everything they've done before is almost part of 
yeah, his origin. And that this movie really kind of ends that and then leaves him more in line with the Spider-Man that we're familiar with from the comics. So I think I think you'll like it. But uh, let me know when you see it and we'll talk. Well, I mean, let's keep talking anyway. So right. cool. All right, man. Good talking to you. Thanks again. Uh, my camera's ready to die, so I got to go. But All right. Bye-bye. Awesome talking to you. Lots of fun. And uh, right. good luck with your whole life. Thanks. You too, man. We'll Bye. be in touch. Bye-bye. Yeah, for sure. And there it is, the finale, the sweet, sweet closure you you were looking for of my talk with David Keller. Man, I had a really great time. I know I said that a few times already, but I'm going to say it again. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Dave's a wonderful guy, and he's doing amazing things, and I will admit I'm a David Cutler fan. Uh, make sure to pick up Giant-Sized X-Men, I believe it is, Thunderbird, which is coming out in March or April. Hopefully that leads to more things with the character and, and more things with Dave working on that character because you could tell from our conversation he has a real love for it. And, you know, he uh, he's proud of what he's doing in the comics. I'm proud of what he's doing in the comics. And I feel as though we need to continue to support homegrown creatives that are out there keeping their dreams alive, keeping our dreams alive by bringing amazing art to cool and beloved characters. So... Uh, Dave, if you're listening, which I'm sure you are, uh, keep keep at it, buddy. You're killing it. Killing it, man. And I can't wait to see what the next project is. But for you, gentle listener, my next project will be in two weeks' time, in which I speak to another featured guest. That guest, I'm not quite sure who it is yet, but I will know soon. And when I do, I will post it on social media, uh, usually about a week before it comes out, just so you know and you can get excited. Hopefully you get excited. But I have a couple irons in the fire and some cool people on the horizon, so hopefully you get to tune into that. And if you haven't already, please like uh, the post. Please like the Facebook page. Um, please follow us on Instagram. Uh, please subscribe and uh, please share. You know, get this out there. If, you, if you're a nerd, you're a nerdy person, you like these interviews and you want other people to share in the joy that you're getting from them, then make sure to share it so they can as well. But thank you very much for tuning into this episode and I look forward to seeing you during the next episode and I will catch you then in two weeks' time. <laughs>